This is the first power plant to combine solar and natural gas at the same location. This ensures we can produce clean electricity whenever our customers need it. guy with a newspaper background, so what can they say? Mike's, what are those? Uh, our guest today is John Podesta. It's his fourth visit with the group. The last was in 2009 when he was president and chief executive officer of the Center for American Progress, an organization he founded in 2003 and called a think tank on steroids. He grew up in Chicago, earned his bachelor's degree from Knox College, where he's now a life trustee and a law degree from Georgetown, where he's been a visiting law professor. He spent his early career on Capitol Hill, where he was counsel on the majority staff of the Senate Judiciary Committee, working with Ted Kennedy, and later chief counsel of the Senate Agriculture Committee. In 1988, he founded the well-known government relation firm Podesta Associates with his brother, Tony. He returned to the Hill in 95 as counselor to Democratic leader Tom Daschle, before serving President Clinton first as deputy chief of staff, and then as White House Chief of Staff from 1998 to 2001. He was co-chairman of President Obama's transition team in 2008. Above and beyond those titles, he's the proud father of Air Force Captain Gabe Podesta. Our guest Twitter followers caught a glimpse of the two of them together during the President's recent visit to Bagram Air Base. So much for biography, now, now onto the ever popular process portion of our program. <clears throat> ANGA, America's Natural Gas Alliance, is sponsoring a number of monitor breakfasts, including today's. Our thanks to ANGA CEO Marty Durbin and colleagues Erica Bowman and Dan Witten, who are sitting at the table back there, keeping me from the pain of premature retirement. <laughs> Sponsored or not, we're on the record here. Please, no live blogging or tweeting. In short, no filing of any kind while the breakfast is underway to give us time to actually listen to what our guest says. There's no embargo when the session ends. As regular attendees know, the Monitor Breakfast is one of the last bastions of fusty folkways. So if you'd like to ask a question, please do the traditional thing and send me a subtle, non-threatening signal, and I'll happily call on one and all in the time we have available. We'll start off by offering our guests the opportunity to make some opening comments, then we'll move to questions from around the table. And with that, thanks again for doing this, sir. Thank you, Dave. It's always good to be here. And uh, I want to start off, I'll just uh, talk for two minutes. Uh, and say that lots been going on in Washington this week, uh, but one of the things that I've been uh, particularly focused on uh, is the rollout of the proposal to reduce carbon pollution from uh, power plants uh, across the United States, uh, which uh, Gina McCarthy announced on Monday. Uh, and I, I raise that because one of my principal duties now at the White House is to coordinate our activity on climate change and, and energy. Uh, uh, and, and put this in a little bit of context, uh, power plants uh, are, account for about 40% of the CO2 pollution in, in the U.S., about a third of the overall greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's the largest source of carbon dioxide emissions in the United States, so it's very important to reduce uh, that level of pollution. As you all know, uh, the president uh, began uh, the, uh, to discuss this uh, proposal uh, when he went to Children's Hospital to tape his weekly address. Uh, a, uh, a week ago today, uh, which aired uh, last Saturday. And the reason he did that is because there are huge public health benefits that will attend uh, uh, and come from this rule. More than 130,000 uh, uh, asthma attacks amongst children avoided, uh, 2,800 heart attacks avoided, uh, 2,700 to 6,600 uh, premature deaths. Um, more than 1,800 visits uh, to hospitals for cardiovascular and respiratory illnesses uh, avoided uh, 310,000 lost work days. Today at noon, we'll be releasing a report that uh, links uh, the effects of climate change to public health. M many of the uh, benefits that I just discussed come from the co-benefit, if you will, from reducing uh, traditional pollutants, uh, SO2, NOx, uh, and uh, and uh, 
uh, PM 2.5 uh, emissions. But uh, climate change itself will increasingly uh, be a problem for our public health. Uh, and the report that we're releasing, the white paper we're releasing, goes through the recent National Climate Assessment uh, as well as the uh, IPCC report to, to show how the effects of climate change will have effect on ground level ozone, uh, which is predicted to raise, for example, uh, the, the uh, emergency room visits in Suffolk County by 10% uh, over the next decade. Uh, it's, uh, there are more phosphory days, which means there are pl more plant-based allergens uh, in, in the upper Midwest, uh, which will lead uh, to more uh, lost uh, work days. Uh, uh, carbon pollution enhances the urban heat island effect, so it, it again, it hurts. Uh, it has a particular uh, effect on, particularly on the elderly who are living in, uh, in, uh, in environments where they can be affected by uh, strong heat waves. Uh, and the distribution of diseases from uh, West Nile virus or Lyme disease are already being affected uh, in the United States. Uh, particularly uh, dealing with, with uh, this rule, reducing carbon pollution, uh, will have a big effect on asthma. It's the third, uh, third leading cause of hospitalization for children. African Americans are twice as likely to be hospitalized for asthma as whites. Uh, Latino children are 40% more likely to die from asthma as white children. So uh, in 2004 alone, uh, the U.S. spent $5 billion on me Medicaid on asthma-related illnesses. So this is a big deal. Uh, we intend to get the job done. We've created a flexible rule that can be implemented by the states, uh, but it'll have enormous uh, public health benefits. Uh, so I just wanted to start with that because it's been what I've been up to this week. Uh, I would note that the jobs report came out this morning. We have, a, we have a rule in the White House that we don't talk about that till 9.30. So I'll watch Dave's, cl Dave's clock here. And if uh, anybody wants to ask me about that when, it, when the bewitching hour hits, I'm happy to talk about it. Thank you. Let me do one or two, and then we'll move around the table. We're going to start with uh, Kate from The Post, and then uh, Darren Good, David Unger, Steve Toma, uh, George Condon, John Dizzy, and Susan Page. Um, press coverage. Of the, of the power plant rule listed four, among others, four hurdles that could stand in the way of actually getting it implemented. A court challenge, uh, action uh, by coal dependent states, uh, action by Congress under the Congressional Review Act, or action by the next president, um, since the states have until 2018 to file plans. Which of those risks do you consider the greatest, and what are you doing to counter it? Well. Uh we're committed to getting this done. That's why we released it now. Uh, we have a year uh, to finalize the rule. We'll t we're taking comments for 120 days. Uh, the, we had a request from a number of uh, senators to extend the normal 60-day comment period to 120 days, uh, which we, uh, after discussions with EPA, EPA agreed to do that. So we'll hear from stakeholders across the country over the course of the next 120 days. Uh, I said when I came into my uh, position in January, one of the principal things I needed to do was to make sure that uh, the direction to EPA that the President gave last summer uh, as part of the overall climate action plan uh, was to uh, propose this rule by uh, June 1. Uh, when I said that, I didn't realize June 1 was a Sunday, so we did manage to get it in on June 2nd. And we're committed to finishing the rule by next June. That'll give the states one year to create implementation plans that are then reviewed by EPA. Uh, you noted, uh, Dave, that, that some states can move that back, uh, particularly if they get together uh, in regional arrangements, which is the most cost-effective way uh, uh, that uh, states uh, might come together to get the reductions that are uh, will be required once the rule is finalized. Uh, and if they choose to go that route, as the Northeast states have done under the so-called REGI program, uh, or as California has done under its AB32 program, to go to uh, a more market-based system and, and get together uh, to find the most cost-effective uh, 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 reductions, then they'll have till 2018 uh, to finalize those plans. So I'm, I'm quite confident we'll get our job done I'm uh, also quite confident that we will resist any, um, uh, I, I have no doubt that there will be an, an, an attempt to, 
to try to overturn this uh, through the Congressional Review Act, but I'm certain that we have the votes to, uh, to, uh, to uphold the rule once it is finalized. With respect to the courts, I think there's a long history of uh, litigation now starting in 2007 uh, under uh, Massachusetts versus the EPA that recognizes that uh, CO2 uh, is a, a dangerous pollutant and that the uh, EPA has the authority to regulate it. Uh, there's no doubt going to be legal challenges to this or legal challenges to almost everything the EPA does. Uh, but uh, they've had a, a stunning string of successes just this uh, spring in terms of upholding their authority uh, to tackle these you know, major causes of uh, pollution and major causes of uh, illness in our country. Last one for me about the politics of all this. As you know, the president's been quoted as saying, I really don't care to be president without the Senate. But uh, former Bush speechwriter Michael Gerson wrote in the Post this morning that in the contest between presidential legacy and Democratic Senate control, Obama has chosen legacy, adding that five months before the Senate majority will be determined, Obama is complicating the message of some Democratic Senate candidates and exposing them to political risks he refused to take himself, unquote. What, if anything, is wrong with that analysis? Well, if, if some of you may remember me from my previous service in the White House when I worked for President Clinton where I banned the word legacy. Uh, and I, you know, I don't think uh, the president thinks about it in those terms. I think what the president is uh, thinking about is that he has an obligation to the American people, uh, to, to children and the grandchildren of people who are uh, uh, making decisions today uh, to, to build a, a, a cleaner and brighter future for them, to build a strong economy based on a clean energy future, to tackle uh, the uh, problem of catastrophic climate change. We're seeing the, uh, uh, the cost of that already uh, from uh, increased uh, droughts to heat waves to uh, storm surges to sea level rise across the country we're seeing uh, the effects of climate change we're seeing it in the public health, as I mentioned earlier. So I think the pre uh, the president's obligation is to uh, do what uh, he needs to do under uh, the legal authorities that he's been granted uh, by Congress through the Clean Air Act uh, to ensure that we tackle this most Im important, really almost existential problem. And I think that uh, if you think about it from a political perspective, the Washington Post just had a poll out this week that showed there's broad support uh, for taking action to reduce carbon pollution. It's, it's, it was at roughly 70% across the country. There's uh, in, in uh, red states and blue states, uh, amongst Republicans, independents, and Democrats, there's very strong support uh, for taking action to reduce carbon pollution. There's no doubt there's, there, there are some states um, where this is a, an, a, an issue that uh, that pre presents uh, a different sort of political challenges, uh, particularly coal-producing states. And there's no doubt that the polluters will come after uh, uh, <clears throat> this rule, and they'll try to attack it and try to knock down that approval rating. And they'll try to uh, put it in squarely in the context of the political campaigns that are, that are ongoing in 2014. But I think if uh, anyone who, who wants to uh, go out and talk about the benefits from this rule, do what the president did, visit a children's hospital in their uh, home state, I think they'll find that the, the, that the politics is, uh, is uh, such that you can defend uh, taking action here and the public will support that. So I think that we think that, um, uh, that uh, people who deny uh, the existence of climate change, who want to try to run uh, suggesting that they really aren't scientists and they don't really get it and they can't really see what's going on around them. Uh, and they want to deny the public health uh, effects that uh, the pollution is having on our, on our uh, families and, and children in the, in the country. I think that's the losing side of the argument. I, I'm certain that uh, if you think about this in the, in the cycle coming forward, anybody who tries to run as a climate denier in 2016 is going to have a very hard time uh, running on that nationally. Whether uh, people need to uh, put together the resources to fight back against uh, an advertising campaign from the Koch brothers and others, uh, I think that, uh, you know, that's, that's politics that people have to decide on their own on a state-by-state -state or district-by-district basis. Katie? 
Um, thanks for taking my question. So I'm wondering, Vesta, have you read of any of Hillary Clinton's book, and what do you think about her writing about her disagreement with President Obama over whether to arm Syrian rebels? Uh, well, I think uh, they, you know, it's um, it was probably a hard choice. <laughs> 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 but I think she was, uh, I have uh, no doubt that, that uh, the uh, narrative that she tells in, that, in the book uh, from her experience as Secretary of State will be an honest one and she'll uh, uh, lay the facts out as, as uh, she felt them and saw them. And uh, I'm anxious to read it. I've read, I've read uh, some of the excerpts of the book and I saw uh, a little bit, of, uh, a, a, a couple of passages of it earlier. Uh, but uh, I'm like most of you. I'm still I'm still catching up with the pass with the excerpts that are now uh, being printed. I, I think it'll be in, it, you know I th I'm sure it'll be uh, uh, interesting for the public to see what it's like uh, to have to take on those tough problems that she took on uh, quite successfully. I think as Secretary of State. So I think the public is you know awaiting uh, being able to line up at. Uh, at the bookstore in, in Manhattan, I guess, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, uh, and, and, and get copies of the book. Darren? Thank you. I'm trying to get too far in the weeds of what is a very complicated EPA rule, yeah. even for EPA I'll, I'll rules. I'll try not to, too. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, but one thing I thought that kind of stood out, and one thing that you mentioned earlier was about how some states have until as late as 2018 to finalize how they're going to do this. And as you know, that puts you into the next administration. Do you run the risk of possibly ceding too much leverage and ground to that next White House, especially if a Republican is there? Well, you know, I, I think that, uh, again, the, the country needs to tackle this problem. I think the, with the, the deadline of 2018 uh, exists for states that want to join together uh, to try to reduce emissions in the most cost-effective way possible. I think states that choose that option um, will make a commitment to do that and carry forward with uh, making those reductions. The rule will have been finalized. So the need for states to reduce their emissions will have, gone, uh, will have been finalized by the end of the uh, Obama administration. So they'll, they'll, have, they'll be under legal obligation to try to take those reductions down. And I think the states that decide that whether they want to join with California, uh, and I know that there's some discussion uh, on the West Coast of, of not only Washington and Oregon, uh, but other states perhaps combining with uh, the uh, AB32 system that California has implemented, or more states want to uh, uh, join REGI, maybe New Jersey would go back into REGI or other states, uh, depending on what the, the outcome of the election in Pennsylvania, you might see uh, that happening. Uh, uh, there are other states that might decide that's the path forward. But I think once you've made that decision, then I think there, there, there'll be a legal obligation to move forward with it. There'll be a com political commitment to move forward with it. And I think that this rule will be implemented. You know, uh, uh, President Bush tried to overturn a number of uh, rules that President Clinton issued at the end of his term. I believe none were successful. Uh, uh, many in the, in the environmental arena. Uh, a few that President Bush finally, when they finally did go into effect, uh, took credit for, uh, if, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, uh, in, including the diesel rule and, uh, and others. But he tried to reverse some of the uh, appliance efficiency rules, et cetera, and, they were, and, and basically the courts upheld them because they were finalized under it, as is appropriate and uh, under the under the uh, laws that were prevailing at the time. So uh, people can try to, you know, uh, to roll it back. I'm fairly confident, you know, of course, I'm fairly confident we'll have a president who embraces the cause of uh, tackling climate change and uh, reducing emissions. And as I said, I think that uh, if you think about a, a challenge in the, in the 2016 context, and the politics in, of this in the 2016 context. If you're a climate denier uh, trying to run nationally, uh, I think you're going to have a very hard road to hoe uh, getting elected president of the United States. Mr. Unger? 
Um, can you talk a little bit about what's next for the Climate Action Plan? Are these rules, is that, is that the peak? Uh, are, do you hope to accomplish more in the remainder of Obama's presidency? So, well, um, the, there is, uh, uh, again, the, the Climate Action Plan that was put out last summer is based on three pillars. Uh, mitigation, of which uh, this is a, uh, is, I, I've described it as a crown jewel, but there are other elements of that, including uh, implementing uh, uh, efficiency rules for heavy duty trucks uh, and, and uh, more deployment of uh, renewables. We're doubling the amount of renewables on public, uh, uh, permitted on public lands. Uh, we just uh, had a successful solar summit. The president is, was out in California recently uh, expanding both the commitment to uh, distributed solar and, and uh, as well as to more building efficiency through the build, Better Building Initiative. But one is mitigation. Uh, the second is resilience. Uh, again, this is the first administration that's really focused on the fact that we're looking at a significant amount of climate change already baked in the system and that communities are going to have to react to that, plan for that, uh, and build uh, more resilient economies uh, going forward. So uh, the, there's a whole work stream going forward on that. Uh, the president's proposed a billion dollars in the current budget uh, to uh, give the states and, and, and communities the resources they need to begin to plan for the, if you will, baked in effects of, of climate change. And the third is on the international front. So we, uh, we have a, a strong a dialogue going at uh, both the multilateral level. The president was just at the G7. This was a uh, serious topic. Uh, and all the G7 leaders uh, recommitted themselves to try to move forward towards a positive outcome in the uh, negotiations that will culminate in Paris in 2015, uh, and all committed to put forward uh, significant uh, reduction strategies in the post-2020 period uh, at that time. Uh, they also spent a lot of time talking about building energy security, particularly uh, in the European system as a result of uh, the aggressive action that the Russians have taken uh, in Ukraine. So uh, there's a lot to do at the international side. Uh, uh, one of the principal uh, places we're in dialogue is with the Chinese. Uh, there's, uh, there's some news coming out of China, but it's mostly from the academic advisors to the government about what they intend to do uh, in this uh, post-2020 period. But there's movement uh, uh, in China in terms of taking on commitment to, to have their emissions peak and then uh, gradually reduce them. So yeah, there's a lot to do. Uh, this is, I think this is the most important element, but is one element of a multi-pronged strategy. Steve? Here. There's talk in the Congress now about at least some temporary measures, just giving vouchers so veterans can go to Medicare. Why not do that permanently? Why not just turn the whole thing into a voucher and let people go to Medicare, which by all accounts seems to work pretty well? Well, I think that the veteran system, uh, and, and I think that uh, people who y y you've seen in the press recently, uh, has served veterans well when they're getting care. You know, this has been a problem of being able to get into the system. I think that the bill that uh, Senator Sanders uh, and Senator uh, McCain uh, just agreed upon last night is a much better way to go uh, than privatizing uh, veterans' health care. I think we have a sacred obligation to our veterans to provide uh, health benefits that they've been promised. And I think that the resources that are contained uh, in the Sanders-McCain bill, the focus on getting more primary care doctors uh, into the system, the focus uh, on um, uh, improving uh, the facilities that would come from the resources that are contained in that bill would be a much better way to go than, than, uh, than simply privatizing the system. And I, the, um, uh, you know, that builds on uh, uh, the president's commitment, which sometimes gets lost in, uh, in, the, in the recent conversations of having uh, expanding access for, uh, for, for PTS, for Agent Orange, for, uh, uh, for taking care of the uh, veterans that are uh, the, the uh, baby boomer veterans who are now entering the system, uh, as well as the post 9-11 veterans who, who need care and need the quality of care that the veteran system is capable of delivering. But I think we obviously have 
we have problems in, in, uh, in the structure of how that uh, service was, uh, was being performed. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, acting uh, uh, the acting secretary has now taken action, and, as he announced in, in, in Phoenix yesterday, to improve that. But I think it's going to take the kind of legislation that's now moving on a bipartisan basis through the Senate uh, to really improve the delivery of health care in the system. We also obviously are uh, looking and, and, and uh, for uh, someone who, uh, to, to lead the VA, um, uh, who can and lead the, and lead the veterans health system, uh, who can provide the, the kind of uh, reinvention that will be necessary to, to get those improvements in place. George? As you know, there's a lot of Democratic unhappiness with the level of the president's engagement in the, uh, in the congressional campaigns. They're happy with how effective he is at raising money, but don't feel that he's been at all effective in framing a message that the Democrats can run on. I mean, when are we going to see that, and, and how do you break through, or how does he break through uh, all the other issues that are, you know, getting the headlines of well, Bergdahl and VA and everything well, you else. Know, I think that the, the, the president's uh, framed a choice between uh, an economy that works for the middle class and working people versus an, versus a, an economy uh, that is based on old failed ideas. And so his push for raising the minimum wage, which has uh, caught traction across the country as we've seen uh, states and cities uh, raising the minimum wage, his push uh, for, for uh, pay equity, uh, his uh, his uh, 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 push for uh, uh, reforming the way uh, individuals are paid for, uh, for overtime, I think are all things that uh, are uh, valuable uh, uh, you know, pointers in the direction that uh, a, a Democratic Congress would lead the country versus a Republican Congress. So I think he's doing what he needs to do uh, which is doing his job first and foremost, uh, and secondly, putting uh, issues on the table where we can make progress through executive action, but noting that with with Democrats in Congress, they can uh, be much more effective in in getting the economy working to get wages growing uh, for the American public. When does he engage that? Uh, you know, he's not out running himself, and he'll engage when when it's appropriate. He's he makes those he makes that argument. I think. Uh, to Democratic constituencies as he's out around the country. I'm sure the, the, you'll see an increase in that uh, as the campaign season really heats up in the fall. When? 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 <laughs> well, look, I think he's been out there talking about the issues that are important to the American public. And uh, the, uh, whether that's uh, the cost of college, uh, the, uh, the minimum wage, uh, uh, pay equity, uh, those are all issues that are that are critical to the uh, to moving the country forward, and and they're all issues that Democrats on Capitol Hill have said are ones that they want to campaign on. So I think he's he's not on the ballot. They are. They're going to have to make their case to their own constituents. But I think that he can uh, provide a uh, uh, a narrative and a supporting environment that that you know he's trying to make. Let me tell you where we're going next. It's going to be John Gizzi, Susan Page, Jeff Earl, uh, David Joaquin, Karen uh, Bowen, uh, Alexis Semendinger, uh, Jim Cunahan, Lauren Fox, and Todd Gilman to end. Mr. Okay. Gizzi. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, sir, you talked earlier about candidates running as climate change deniers and the problems that they would have. Well, Natalie Tennant, Democratic candidate for the Senate in West Virginia, and uh, Ms. Lundergan Grimes running in Kentucky. Uh, both came out faster than many Republicans in denouncing the new standards and referred to it as an assault on the coal industry. While Republicans, rather than take the climate change approach, their criticism is it's a war on the poor, and they say that this will lead to higher electricity rates for the lowest income earners. How do you respond to those charges and what do you say when other Democrats, such as a Grimes or a Tennant, criticize this within hours? Well, with respect to the Republicans, I think the poor might be surprised to learn that uh, of the uh, concern for them. 
Um, but uh, I think that uh, if you look at the real economics of this, I think that uh, uh, as the EPA analysis shows the uh, prices uh, uh, because of the efficiency that's being built into the system here, you'll see uh, prices, uh, you'll see bills on average uh, uh, go down by about 8% over the course of the program. For all income earners. Uh, for that's the price of, ele of electric bills at, at the household level. So, um, you know, I think that there are things that we need to do to ensure that uh, uh, people uh, and, and uh, the, the, the administration has a commitment to make sure that people get affordable, reliable electricity. We think this bill gives the flexibility to do that. Obviously, the states need to implement it. I mentioned REGI earlier. If you look at the REGI system, the, the nine states that are now uh, in REGI, they've spent a significant amount of money uh, weatherizing uh, the, uh, the homes of low-income individuals, and they've reduced their bills by $2 billion. So it's possible to do that with the right policies, and that's, I think, what we're, we're uh, we're asking the states to look at, and uh, of course, it's ultimately they have the flexibility to decide how to how to move forward with that. Um, the other thing is that I would say is that I'll come back to my where I started, which is the poor are the most affected uh, by the public health uh, implications of continued uh, pollution at the levels that we're seeing. So you know, and I, I gave you some statistics at yeah. the beginning to, to to demonstrate that. So they get both a public health benefit, and I think that uh, there are ways to, to ensure that uh, uh, electricity remains affordable and reliable. And that's why the flexibility is built in the role to do that. With respect to the, uh, the politics in coal country, uh, uh, I, I would say a couple things. First of all, uh, this rule doesn't end coal in the electric system. We're looking at uh, it, re it reduces the, um, uh, the amount uh, over a fairly long period of time, between now and 2030, from about 40% of uh, U.S. electricity production to about 30%. You see increases in gas, uh, in, uh, in renewables, uh, and a significant reduction in demand uh, as a result of the rule. But we're not taking all the coal out of the system. Uh, uh, but the coal that will be burned will have to be done in a more efficient way and a more effective way to, to uh, raise the efficiency of, of coal that's being, uh, that's, uh, that's being utilized. So the oldest, the dirtiest, the least efficient plants, uh, I think uh, util states will make decisions, utilities make decisions about whether to keep those online or whether to retrofit them, uh, but we're not taking coal out of the electric system through this rule. It's now 9.32, so questions on unemployment are, are available, and we're going to go to Susan Page. So here's a question that, given your experience, you are the most qualified person in the world to address, which is, um, having served in the Bill Clinton White House and the Obama White House, how would a Hillary Clinton presidency be different from Obama's presidency and from Bill Clinton's presidency? Well, uh, that's a... That's a Topic I haven't pondered, Susan. Um, you know, I think uh, each each person who comes into office uh, brings their own skills, and the times are different, and the challenges are, are different. Um, you know, we obviously faced the breakup of the of the Soviet Union. We tried to um, uh, expand uh, uh, a uh, democratic and more unified Europe. That's obviously being uh, challenged right now, but I think that the project uh, was, uh, was pushed forward. Uh, we had to deal with al-Qaeda and, uh, and terrorism, but nothing in the way that, uh, that uh, President Bush and then President Obama uh, had to come to grips with in terms of, the, of that question. So I think that um, the challenges will be different. I think people bring their own uh, personalities, their own talents uh, to, the, to the job. I think that uh, one thing that the three of them share uh, is, uh, I think, the purpose of the job, which is, is the purpose of the job, uh, which is their, their primary duty, 
uh, is to ensure that everybody has opportunity in this country. That's what motivated all three of them. That's what, uh, I, and I think if she does decide to run and she is elected president, she'll get up every day uh, as President Obama gets up every day, as President Clinton got every day, up every day and go into the Oval Office and think, what can I do to help the middle class and to help working people? And of course, you've known Hillary Clinton for a long time. If you're gonna choose three adjectives that would describe her presidency, what would they be? <laughs> <laughs> um, disciplined, tough, and uh, determined. Jeff. Yeah, um, one of the real flashpoints uh, on the Hill with the Bergdahl deal have been the terms of his you know, relative confinement in Qatar. So my question is, as the president was chewing this over and weighing the pros and cons, what was his bottom line as far as what terms he might be able to live with that would ensure their security, and to what extent does this become a political problem for you all if these guys are walking around or getting on the internet or inveighing against America in some way that gets broadcast? Well, the Secretary of Defense made the determination uh, that the transfer was in the national security interest uh, of the United States and that the threat posed by the detainees to the United States or U.S. persons uh, would be substantially mitigated. And there were uh, assurances uh, given by the Qataris. I, I can't get into that. There are also uh, ways that we have to monitor them beyond what, uh, what uh, Qatar is doing. Uh, but I think that, that uh, first and, and foremost, the president thought that uh, we had a commitment and a duty uh, to need, leave no uh, man or woman uniform behind on the battlefield. And he exercised that. He's talked about it several times this week. Uh, and so he thought it was the right thing to do, and, he, and the Secretary of Defense, uh, who had to make those findings, felt like, uh, first, it was in the national security interest to move forward with this, and second, that uh, the threat posed by the uh, detainees, now the transferees, uh, could be substantially mitigated. And that's what the, the uh, discussions and dialogue with the Qataris was all about. Monitoring outside of the Qatari. Well, as you, you as you probably know, we have a lot of uh, ways of knowing what people are doing around the ar around the country and around the world. Uh, David. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's fair to say we'll keep an eye on them. Yeah, I, I know you've been in your current role uh, in this administration for a relatively small portion of this administration, mm -hmm. but the president had nearly six years. Has had nearly six years to go big on climate change, um, and specifically to address carbon emissions from power plants. Why did he wait until now to do it? Well, the, you know, I have to say that, uh, that in the first uh, two years, uh, we were seeking, he was seeking legislation. And uh, a bill passed the House, it ultimately didn't pass in the Senate. That was an economy-wide approach that I think if you're an economist, you would say might be more efficient, slightly more efficient in, re in getting those reductions. In the meantime, he got very, very substantial reductions out of the transportation sector, uh, came back into office and immediately began to work on the climate action plan uh, in the second term. And again, the centerpiece of that was to take reductions out of, out of the power sector, which is the largest uh, uh, sector for CO2 emissions in the country, as I've mentioned, 40% of all CO2 emissions come from the power sector. So I think he's been deliberative, first trying to get legislation. When that failed, an assessment that uh, the Congress was unlikely to, to really move forward. In the meantime, I think he was working in sectors of the economy to reduce a CO2 pollution uh, as much as possible. And that's why we're in the position to keep our Copenhagen pledge with this rule to reduce carbon emissions by 17% in the range of 17% by 2020. Uh, had uh, the president not taken the actions in the climate action plan, um, uh, well, let me, let me start that over. Had he not done anything, including the transportation uh, uh, improvements, to, to those of you who think this is just all about fracking and natural gas and these emissions were gonna come down anyway, if he hadn't done that, uh, emissions would have been about 4% above 2005 levels. Having 
done uh, uh, the, those, uh, acti those actions in the first term, they would have been 5% below 2005 levels. As a result of the climate action plans, we'll be in the range of 17% below 2020. So that's a very significant movement. I'd say and, uh, that if you look across the globe, the United States has reduced its emissions uh, more than any other country uh, over this period of time. And uh, I think that's a testament to his, his leadership, both in terms of the investments that were made in clean energy at the beginning of the administration through the Recovery Act, and these, that these important uh, regulations, including much more efficient appliances and, and commercial appliances. Karen? Hi. Um, so you have the benefit of observing this administration from the outside and, and more recently from the inside, and you also have the experience of serving in the Clinton administration. Um, some critics lately, including some Democrats, have accused this White House of political tone deafness lately on the Rose Garden appearance on Bergdahl and um, perhaps uh, the president's uh, maybe, um, in some people's view, slowness to take action on the VA scandal. And I'm, I'm just wondering what you think about, about those criticisms. Look, I think the, the, the president... Uh, yeah, that's sort of having it both ways. I think the president uh, knew this was a controversial decision. This was a decision uh, that, the, and he's spoken to this, that he's taken ownership of, that he went out in the Rose Garden because it was important to explain to the American people that this was uh, about an actual human being uh, who was under uh, great distress uh, being held by the Taliban and that while controversial, he needed to explain that to the American people. And he, he uh, makes no apologies for that, as he said uh, yesterday in Europe, and, and I think it was the right decision, and, and we'll move forward with it. With respect to um, uh, the uh, VA, uh, he asked Secretary Shinseki to do a review. Uh, the, the, uh, after those reviews were done, I think the Secretary decided uh, that the, the department would be led, would be better led by someone else, and he accepted his resignation. So, uh, you know, these are t these are tough calls. Uh, I think particularly uh, the decision uh, to bring back Sergeant uh, Bergdahl was certainly a tough call. We knew it would be controversial, but it was the right thing to do. And uh, the, as uh, Chairman Dempsey said, this was our last uh, clear <laughs> chance to bring him home, and the president. Uh, made a decision to do that and took the heat for it. Alexis? Um, John, because of your role in the transition and, and now, I wanted to come back to the Guantanamo question. Can you speak up for the agent among us? Sure. <laughs> because, because of your role in um, President-elect Obama's transition and your role now, I wanted to go back to the Guantanamo question. Does the president believe that he has the constitutional uh, executive authority before the end of his term to close Guantanamo on his own say so, believing that it's a national security issue to transfer the detainees before he departs? Look, I think the president wants to close Guantanamo. He's working very hard to do it, and I think he's doing it within the bounds of the law that uh, is being, are being passed by the, uh, by, uh, the Congress. So I think that uh, we've uh, let our friends on Capitol Hill know uh, what uh, restrictions are unacceptable uh, in the current round of negotiation, and I think that uh, we'll just keep working to ensure that uh, the remaining detainees there are uh, moved or tried, or uh, and that the Guantanamo is closed by the end of the administration. Uh, the ladies, just to follow up, what Karen's asking. Um, there's a quote in the New York Times today from a Senate Democrat saying that we've got to stop putting out fires relating to Guantanamo after the VA. Are you sympathetic to Senate Democrats who feel that way? Look, I think that, that uh, we'd like to be talking about the economic future of the country. But when the president has an obligation, when there's a problem, uh, as, as we found uh, in the scheduling at the VA, that you have to tackle it. When there's the opportunity uh, to bring Sergeant Bergdahl home, it's a tough call, but you have to make it. And that, that just gets served up to you. And I think that the president's going to make those tough decisions. And 
and uh, and the, uh, I think the context for that is he will keep coming back and coming back and will do it uh, when he comes back from Europe uh, and talking about an economic program that will deliver better results for the American people. But there, you, you know, you just don't get the choice in, in this game to say, you know, I'm, I, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to wait till after November uh, to deal with the opportunity to bring one of our uh, young soldiers home uh, who's been, uh, you know, uh, who, who's been captured by the Taliban. That doesn't, you don't, that you don't get to make that call. You have to make a decision right then and there. And he made it, he made the right decision uh, to, uh, to bring Sergeant Bergdahl home. Jim? Thanks. Uh, John, I want to ask you about immigration. Uh, you, your focus on, on using the president's uh, executive authority to deal with some of these things. The White House has asked uh, Jay Johnson and the Pentagon to stand down for now on, on any uh, actions, that administrative actions that could be taken. Uh, presumably because Congress, you think House Republicans can act between now and August. We but, hope they can act. But um, I wonder if, if, if just the mere threat of taking action is, is, is jeopardizing your position because Republicans will say, well, you know, he's still going to do something on his own. And at the same time, given the limits of what you can do through executive action, aren't you also putting yourself between a rock and a hard place with, with the advocates of of uh, legal status who want broader action from you? Yeah, um, I never really tried to make a living psychoanalyzing the Republicans. So um, uh, I think there is an opportunity. I think that Speaker Boehner would like to see legislation move forward. That's what I think. Um, and, I, and, and I think that's what the president thinks, that there is an opportunity to get comprehensive immigration reform done that's, uh, that will, uh, is a much better solution uh, and a permanent solution uh, for a broken immigration system uh, and the pain that it's, that it's uh, causing uh, across the country. So if that means we have to wait to see whether the uh, Republican leadership can get a compromise together that can earn bipartisan support over the course of the summer, uh, uh, the president's prepared to do that. Uh, but I think if um, uh, the secretary is, is reviewing his authorities about how to uh, particularly uh, alleviate uh, the uh, pain of family dislocation uh, that he's focused on, and uh, we're, you know, I think we'll have to think through what our options are if the Congress is just unable to act. And you know that's a. Uh, I, I think that if we went ahead and acted, I'm fairly certain that they would use that as an excuse for inaction. So we'll have to wait and make an assessment. Uh, you know, sometime during the course of of this summer about whether they have the capacity to act. Are, you, are, your, are the moves that you have at your disposal? Uh, broad enough to even satisfy people who want something comprehensive done? I'm not going to forecast that. Lauren? I want to follow up on immigration. The President's administration determined this week that uh, the number of unaccompanied minors coming mm. across the border has <clears throat> risen to the level of a humanitarian crisis. I'm curious, you know, how the administration is looking at that issue in the context of immigration reform and how that might propel them to act um, act now where maybe before they were willing to hold off a little bit longer? Well, we've seen a big uh, bump uh, this summer. That's largely coming from Central America, as you know. Um, and the, the law requires that uh, it, and, unless the children, are, unaccompanied minors, are coming from Canada or Mexico, they can't be returned. Uh, they need to be turned over to the Department of Health and Human Services. That's, uh, uh, and the, that, that surge in numbers has put real pressure on the system. So uh, Secretary Johnson has pulled together uh, an a interagency group to work uh, this problem with a, a task force that's uh, led by FEMA and Craig Fugate to find and ensure that the, the children, this, you know, this is a heartbreaking 
a situation where you see 10, 12-year-old kids uh, unaccompanied by their parents fleeing violence, in, in, uh, particularly in, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Central America, trying to find their way up to the U.S., sometimes, often to be reunited with their parents who are, who are living up here. It's another reason why I think we need to reform the system and, and uh, get a legal immigration system that, that's going to work and, and, and be viable. But in the meantime, we have to deal with the, with the humanitarian crisis. And so uh, all the agencies of government, uh, uh, led by DHS and HHS, but now coordinated by, uh, by FEMA, are, are finding appropriate places to, uh, to uh, house and make sure that those kids are safe and well taken care of. Republicans in Congress are looking at this issue as a reason to expedite uh, their actions? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Todd? Uh, let me get back to the EPA issue. So the critics of what the administration is doing point to these figures that I think come from the Chamber of Commerce that show that this rule would cause job losses averaging about 224000 per year for the next 15, 16 years. And you said earlier something that struck me that climate change is an existential issue. So I'm wondering if it's truly an existential issue, are you even taking into account whether there are potential job losses and, and sure. economic costs? Sure, if you look at the, if you look at the uh, uh, EPA filings, you'll see what our analysis is of, of the effect on jobs. And we think it'll have a positive effect uh, because we'll build out more uh, clean energy infrastructure in the short term and much more uh, building efficiency and uh, efficiency in general in the electric system uh, over the long term. So I think that these claims of massive job losses have largely been debunked. They're raised, they're based on a, uh, a set of assumptions that are, have zero to do with the rule that was put on the table. So they're fantasy uh, job loss numbers. Uh, they're basically been debunked by independent experts who have looked at them. And uh, it's, that, that isn't to say that there, there aren't going to be places uh, and occupations where, the, where you'll see some job loss. And I think we need to be sensitive to that, attend to it, make investments in communities that might be affected by job loss, whether that's the loss of a, of a plant or, or, uh, or, or otherwise, and ensure that we have the uh, and, and we in the White House are marshalling our efforts to make sure that we can respond to that. But I think that the Congress also has an important role to play in, in smoothing that transition. But every time that uh, a environmental regulation has been put forward, the polluters say massive job losses, you know, lights going off, electricity system crashing, bills going through the roof. They're wrong before, they're wrong now. I think that the, the particular chamber study you referenced, uh, as I said, is based on assumptions that have absolutely zero to do with the rule that the EPA put forward. So it's a, it's a fantasy analysis. Okay, so I'll, I'll take that. But in terms of your motivation, if you see climate change as an existential threat to the country, maybe to the planet, is I see why, it's also why, why I see, balance anything at all? I mean, well, because I see it slower. also as a as a you know we're paying the cost. We had over a hundred billion dollars of uh, of uh, losses last year from extreme weather events. We're already paying the cost. The question is where which side is the risk on? We think we can build. Uh, a, a stronger economy, a better economy based on a clean energy future. S the people who are invested in the status quo, the polluters, want to keep getting the rents out of the current system. So that's what the debate is. But there's no question uh, that the opportunity to build new industries, uh, to, do, to uh, create jobs, uh, to create new technology, to make the world a global leader uh, in clean tech is available to us. The question is whether we'll put the right policy environment uh, in place to ensure that, that that goes forward. So I think that uh, we're very much about trying to build uh, a strong and powerful and good economy. But that will come through investments in cleaner energy systems, not in reliance 
on the systems that, that we've had in place, which are now uh, increasingly burdening our economy uh, through these losses from uh, in agriculture, in forestry, uh, in extreme weather losses, in storm surges, in sea level rise. Uh, that you know, uh, if you if you want to if you want to ask the question, where's the risk? Clean or dirty? I'd ask the reinsurance industry. Leslie. You mentioned that the uh, president's commitment to veterans got a little lost with all the furor over the wait list times. Uh, I was just wondering if there's any review in the executive branch of the fact that there were so many IG reports on the waiting list problem and that it wasn't identified sooner. Um, also, whether or not uh, sort of a review with the Bergdahl decision <coughs> and not to notify Congress given the uh, level of anger over, over there, if maybe there, you should have. Well, with respect to the second, I mean, the, the uh, people who, who made the decision are up briefing the Congress. So they'll, they'll hear uh, uh, why. Uh, but I think that there was uh, uh, evidence that, uh, or at least that there, the, there was uh, um, an, a, an analysis that, uh, that a premature disclosure could result in uh, the loss of his life because of divisions in the Taliban, et cetera. So they'll, they'll answer those questions. With respect to the former, I think we're always trying to, to uh, take a look. And in, in this case in particular, I'm sure that um, Sloan Gibson, and, and, uh, and uh, who now is the acting secretary, uh, Rob Neighbors, who's, who's uh, gone over to the VA from the White House, uh, uh, when, when we have a full complement of people at the top at the VA, are going to uh, drill down and look at that at that question, and I think we all we owe it to our veterans and we owe it to uh, American citizens to to always be asking why did we miss that not not just in this particular case but across you know other issues in government to increase the efficiency and the effectiveness of, go of government so, so you 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 uh, you try to learn from error rather than uh, rather than uh, uh, just you know, run from it, and I think that's what we'll have to do here. With respect to the specifics, the specific question you asked me, again, I think that that's what uh, that's what Rob and the acting secretary are are in the process of doing, trying to figure out why was, you know, this wasn't a one-off uh, problem in Phoenix. There was more uh, systematic uh, uh, error here, and why wasn't that attended to earlier? We've only got a minute left, so I'm going to take a moderator's prerogative and ask you, you've talked about how diff the presidents were different. How's your role different? How do you, how's, why'd you come back? It's a lot better to be the counselor than the chief of staff. <laughs> okay. I guess, well, <laughs> we've got the quote there. Thank you for doing this, John, very much. We, we appreciate it. I hope you'll come back. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>